In those days, radio was a power and a light in the land. People in their homes at night gathered by the radio and heard the crackling, stilted reports of a world they had only read about, and now imagined more intensely. Radio fixes the person, but frees the imagination. And the people most affected by it were those who lived and listened alone. One of broadcasting's best-known voices was that of Ainsley Rupert MacReady. You will not remember that elaborate name, but he was a great man in the days of radio's power, and your parents would have waited up for his late-night stories. Good evening, everyone. This is Ainsley Rupert MacReady speaking to you once again. Tonight I come to the last part of this week's intriguing, chilling story. And if you're certain that you're warm and safe, I will begin. He had a reputation then. That elaborate name was as famous as it was lovely. And the newspapers sometimes called him the disturbing gentleman of the wireless. Every week, he read a story on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights. He was the last thing broadcast. After him came silence and darkness, in which he walked slowly home, enjoying the deserted, trembling city. They were frightening stories, macabre, suspenseful, supernatural, tales of mystery and imagination. He wrote the stories himself and read them while the ink was scarcely dry. The cat was nowhere to be seen. But there were moist prints across the lady's pillow that might have been left by dainty paws. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this week's story entertained you without being too alarming. This is Ainsley Rupert MacReady trusting that you sleep well. Right. Let's take him with the show, yeah? Right. so much. I do appreciate a biscuit with my sherry. Well, how nice. Well, that's another one done with. What did you think of it then? Now, don't spare my feelings. Wonderful, yeah. I liked it as much as the missing antimacassar, sir. Did you, dear boy? Did you indeed? That's good to hear. I think the cat is a very potent creature. I closed my eyes as I listened. That's the spirit of radio the very thing. It's a medium that leaves us blind and dumb. All the world is guided into the ears. There's a magic to radio. It blows gently upon the embers of the imagination until they flare up into a fire that nothing will put out. Have you anything in mind for next week? They've got a title for us. <laughs> the germ of an idea, yes. It concerns a traveling magician the uh, great Orsino, shall we say. Well, this Orsino was a very skillful conjurer, but he's reached a very interesting and awkward condition in which he begins to believe in his own tricks. He believes he has powers. Exactly so. Well, he takes on a boy, only a child, as an assistant. And the boy is dexterous, nimble and obliging, but he will not do the disappearing trick. Orsino has a magic cabinet, you see, with a false bottom or some such thing. In goes the boy, say the relevant words, open the lid. Where is the little fellow? Gone away. You know the sort of effect. But the boy looks into the cabinet and says, 
I would prefer not to enter the box, Mr. Orsino. Just like that. You never explain why the boy dreads the box. Not at all. It's a mysterious anxiety. Perhaps the boy himself cannot understand it. So the situation goes on and Orsino becomes more and more disgruntled because the boy denies him this one trick. And so one day, by some ploy which I will think of, he maneuvers the boy into the box. However, the box jams. All this transpires on stage, you understand. And Orsino is unable to open it. The audience is agitated. Orsino was helpless. And by the time a blacksmith can be summoned to break it open, the boy has asphyxiated. Wonderful. The box is possessed. Hmm. Not finished yet, though. Orsino takes a short convalescence and returns to the stage. But as time goes by, he starts to hear a child's voice in the middle of the night asking to be let out of a wardrobe, or at the climax of a trip. Increasingly, Orsino becomes haunted by this poignant, treble voice. Think of the downcast pathos in a boy's voice. And the boy is seeking sweet vengeance. Intent on frightening Orsino to death. I'll work up a chilling climax. A pretty study in claustrophobia, I fancy. He lived alone in a small, enclosed splendor, like a man alone admiring himself. I expect, as in any other week, when he had told us the coming story, he went home to write it. He was facile and quick whenever there was a deadline and he relished the fearful threat of having nothing done when the moment came to speak. He was an orderly man, and this was his risk. So, in his hushed study with sherry and biscuits, he would write the words that were to be read aloud. He boasted shyly that he never wrote more than he would read on one day. He sometimes wrote by candlelight, for he was a devout believer in atmosphere. My goodness, where did that draft come from? Mm. Dear, dear. There we are again, Mr. Orsino. Did you think you could throw me off your tracks? The next Monday, he was splendid, sitting by the microphone in another small circle of light, imagining worlds, lives, and fates for all of us. As for his costume, it was an intricate machine, loaded and primed with colored handkerchiefs, china eggs, and white doves that the boy treated with the same powder. Orsino used on his hands. This was in order that the elderly dowdy birds should seem wonderful every night. It depressed the boy, and he loathed having to hold the feeble doves in his hands while Orsino abused them. The boy had a gentle nature and never realized how much he disliked
Nothing to be afraid of, dear boy. You can always talk to yourself if the silence becomes unbearable. Isn't that true, Ainsley Rupert McCready? speaking. Who are you? Who is it? The story you are reading. What of it, little boy? You are a little boy. I would prefer you to go no further with it. No further? Why not indeed? It troubles me a great deal. This is preposterous. Who are you? Is this some kind of prank disturbing my sleep? Oh, I didn't think you were asleep. Most certainly. You sound very attentive and alert. What's that? You are not a little boy. Who are you? studio. We're going ahead in 10 seconds from now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Rupert Ainsley McCready speaking to you once again, continuing with this week's story, A Child's Voice. I, I beg your pardon, I mean, this is Ainsley Rupert McCready speaking to you, no, not, not as I said, <laughs> even a storyteller sometimes gets uh, a little lost. boy, whispered Orsino. Not likely on the wood, but there was no sound. Only the glossy black surface of the cabinet. Kick glaring. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it's good night from your host, Ainsley McCready. Dreadful. It's the usual, Sherry, sir. Cask Amontillado. No, 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 no. Don't be dense. Don't be kind. Spare me kindness. What is it, sir? I was a wreck tonight. I couldn't get a sentence out without shaking and shuddering. Yes, 
seem to go very well, sir. Nonsense. I made every kind of fluff. I felt as if I was... I was being smothered. I'm sure you're mistaken, sir. Mistaken? I'm a professional, dear boy, and not mistaken in these matters. I'm sure you've had no end of telephone calls asking if I was drunk. No, sir, there have been no telephone calls. None at all. None? Not one all night. There's no one listening. Were you listening up there? Oh, yes, sir. As always. You heard then? I was... I stammered! Oh, no, sir. It was as smooth as silk. She stood on the balcony, inexplicably mimicking him, hiccuping as she amicably welcomed him in. She stood on the balcony, inexplicably mimicking him, hiccuping as she amicably welcomed him in. I saw a pair of parrots perched on the portrait of Parnell. I saw a pair of parrots perched on the portrait of Parnell. The aghast Orsino stared down. Not at flawless emptiness, such as the cabinet was supposed to contain, but at the terribly disheveled and splayed body of the child, driven by horror towards suffocation in all too easily imaginable contortions and screams, which strangely, no one outside the box had heard. Yes, I think that does very nicely.
the third night was made for the revelation of a suspenseful tale. Outside, there was a thunderstorm. Inside, MacReady too was electric with nervous energy that none of us understood at the time. Perhaps he wondered if he would finish the story. In the event, the decision was not his. The broken lid came up in two pieces, and the aghast Orsino stared down, not at flawless emptiness, such as the cabinet was supposed to contain, but at... Hold it, A.R. Circuit's blown up here. We're going to look for the fault. Relax. J just stay where you are. I say, what is this? Are you fellows teasing me? cut was only a few minutes and no one ever discovered how the door came to be locked they are. They are. it created a stir at the time because the story was never finished and even MacReady's script stopped short of an ending perhaps he meant to improvise he was nearly paralyzed at first, and a doctor said he was in deep shock. He regained most movements, but he never spoke on radio again. Utterance came back to him, but he had a chronic stammer, such as embarrassed people, and he lived in poverty for the rest of his life. Sometimes, afflicted with palsy. There was a look of fear in his eyes. And only on a few good days could he tolerate company. 
by pretending to be dumb.